Real quick for folks on the call, I'm Brian. I'm a co-founder of Xerox Park. We are a research foundation that helps to productionalize uh, a lot of new technologies coming out of the world of cryptography. Uh, we were just talking about how, as a framing for uh, today's talk, uh, we're interested in what's going on with the future of computing. Broadly speaking, this is like an interesting and important question. And today there's a couple of legible things going on with the future of computing. One is like, there's the AI thing. That's a very important one. There's the chips thing. Another important one, there's the VR thing. And then there's also the blockchain slash Web3 thing. And uh, what we were just claiming is that there is another thing that doesn't quite yet have a name and that we don't quite yet know how to think about, but that we have a lot of indirect and direct evidence for exists. And we sort of think about it as this future of computing dark matter. It's this way in which we can think about computing or networking technology evolving that is, doesn't quite fit with the rest of this screen. Um, this dark matter has a lot to do with some of these words that have been popping up in various circles including you know, programmable cryptography, digital physics, autonomous worlds, et cetera. And today we're going to be talking about programmable cryptography. Um, one central guiding question is, what does it look like to reorient from first principles around what can modern applied cryptography do? And not just for crypto or blockchains, but for computer technology as a whole, with crypto and blockchains being very one very important component of it, but not necessarily a totalizing component. And that's kind of the question that is going to set the stage for what we're thinking about today. Um, and as uh, the last thing that I was just saying is that this is a bit more of a philosophical talk. This is not a presentation of a new result or like a groundbreaking breakthrough. Uh, instead, we're arguing for the existence and the significance of a new category and a new perspective on some existing technologies that we're just trying to make sense of today. Okay, cool. Everyone on the same page? All right, let's roll. So three main components to today's talk. The first is what is programmable cryptography. We'll kind of define it and give everybody a sense of the vibe of this phrase. This does not have a strict definition, um, but it has an overall sense of, of what it gestures towards. And then we're going to talk about what can you do with programmable cryptography. Again, from this lens of, you know, not talking about like FHE for MEV or, or any particular blockchain specific topics, but like really, really big picture. Like what are some interesting things that might happen? And then finally, why should we look at programmable cryptography holistically? Why are those speculative applications not merely applications of ZK snarks or multi-party computation or even obfuscation, but rather applications of a broad category that needs to be thought about holistically? Okay, so let's start off with what is programmable cryptography? So, um, oh, and I see a message in the chat. Uh, okay, perfect. Awesome. Okay, so um, I'm going to claim that we are in the midst of a generational transition today in cryptography. We're moving from first generation cryptography to second generation cryptography. So what do I mean by these phrases? Well, by first generation cryptography, I think probably everybody in this room is familiar with the idea of things like encryption and signatures, digital signatures. We've, we've had these things for about 50 years now. Um, we commonly associate their applications with words like security or privacy or integrity. Um, and these things are, are widespread, you know, more than 95% of internet traffic goes over HTTPS, which means that the vast majority of majority of data on the internet uh, has some cryptographic aspect to it by default. Um, we've got password managers, we've got end-to-end -end encrypted messaging services, more and more of our cloud data is end-to-end -end encrypted. So, you know, cryptography over the last 50 years through these kinds of first generation technologies has taken hold at a global scale. But <clears throat> something's on the horizon and that something is what uh, we've been thinking about at Xerox Park as second generation cryptography or programmable or general purpose cryptography. So this kind of cryptography says, rather than having a protocol that enables you to perform one specific operation with cryptographic guarantees, such as hiding a message such that only someone with a password can see it or proving to you that I'm Alice. Uh, instead, we can do things like make proofs of you know, the execution of any function. We can verify any arbitrary claim. We move from having these special purpose protocols to having these general purpose, almost cryptography compilers. So our cryptographic capabilities are moving from being like, you know, specialized hardware, like an alarm clock to being programmable, like a CPU. And this is a really, really big deal. In general, whenever this happens, this usually catalyzes some kinds of generational shift in what we can do with the technology. So cryptography moves from no longer just being about security and privacy and securing existing systems, to it just being a thing about generally computation and data and the operations that we can perform on these things. And you know, this is something which takes cryptography really back to its roots in information theory, which is something that makes very general statements about uh, what we can know and, and what we can transmit to each other. 
Um, right. And as, as I said, you know, this also moves cryptography from being uh, merely a tool that secures existing systems to uh, a set of building blocks with which we can build powerful new systems. Okay, so um, this is a very low resolution programmable or cryptography tech tree. Uh, the nodes that are not in bold are first generation or special purpose cryptography. So you've got things like digital signatures, special purpose MPC, um, various kinds of encryption. And uh, the things in bold are programmable cryptography. So an arrow is a reduction. It means that something higher on the tree subsumes something lower on the tree. If you have ZK snarks, then you get digital signatures for free. Um, and this is sort of inspired by like there's kind of these diagrams in complexity theory, like the complexity zoo, if folks are familiar with that. So to give an example of what we mean by, you know, crossing this generational transition, let's look at ZK Snarks, which um, how many people in this room are familiar with ZK Snarks? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so basically everybody, we can go through this super quickly. All right, so just to give an example of the flavor of what we mean by programmability. Oh yeah, Alex, do you have a oh, no. question there? Oh, okay. Yeah, you're like super familiar with ZK Snarks. That's... <laughs> um, so let's take a look at identity claims and what we can prove cryptographically um, about these sorts of things. So. For many, many decades, we've known how to prove claims like, I know a private key corresponding to Alice's public key. This is you know, something we can do with a simple digital signature. It's about 50 years old. This is widespread today. So a couple years after we started getting the first signature schemes, uh, people started coming up with all sorts of clever constructions for things like group signature schemes. So now we can prove claims like, I know a private key corresponding to one of Alice, Bob, or Charlie's public keys, but I won't tell you which one. And in order to do this, we sort of need to invent some new math. We need to you know, be clever. Someone needs to write a paper and then we can start proving stuff that looks like this. <clears throat> now, over time, people started coming up with more and more ways to make these kinds of claims more and more flexibly and efficiently. So for example, one thing that we can do uh, with group signature schemes is we can make group signature, signature schemes that allow you know, the other people in the groups to disavow uh, messages that were signed to a group that includes them. So if someone signs a message that includes me in the anonymity set, and I don't like that message, if I didn't sign it, then I might be able to produce a proof that I didn't sign it without revealing who, who did sign it. And then there's schemes that allow you to toggle whether or not you want this property for any given signature. So you can sort of you know flip this bit. Um, and now we're getting to schemes that are pretty complex. You're probably needing a different key generation scheme. You're needing some uh, you know per particular machinery. Someone somewhere needs to write a paper. And then finally, we could imagine getting to claims that are like arbitrarily complex. I know a private key corresponding to one of these people's public keys, and I either possess a signed attestation from one of you know, JP Morgan Chase or HSBC or the IRS, or during the Ethereum block with header X, I knew the private key corresponding to some account uh, with at least 32 ETH, or I possess a biometric that when run through a neural network corresponds to the fingerprint of some non-sanctioned individual, you know, and like sort of arbitrary binary predicates. And if you go to a cryptographer and you ask them to, to build you a cryptographic protocol for this specific claim, um, you know, they'll probably look at you like you're crazy. But uh, this is exactly the sort of thing that we can do today with ZK snarks, with programmable cryptography. So ZK snarks turn math problems into programming tasks. I can write this in some sort of higher level specification or language and go through one of these modern cryptographic compilers <clears throat> in order to get a protocol for that very thing. So this is very powerful. Um, in general, each of these kinds of branches under this framework provides us with a different kind of cryptographic compiler, where I can go from some system logic written in code or specification down to a cryptographic protocol. So, you know, as another illustration, previously we had these special purpose ZKPs. So let's say Alice wanted to prove to Bob she knew a three coloring of G. Bob might say, prove it. Both of them might not know how to do this. They might go to these, you know, fine gentlemen over here and say, please invent to us some math so we can do this kind of ZKP. These folks would invent some new math, and then Alice and Bob would be able to do this like very specific protocol to carry out this operation. Um, today, we don't need these fine gentlemen anymore. Uh, instead, Alice can make some arbitrary claim. I ran GPT a hundred times on my entire private Facebook history, and I outputted Alice loves dogs. Bob says, prove it, and Alice simply provides a 200 byte string that's anchored to that specific claim and the specific inputs that she had. So programmable cryptography, very powerful. Okay, so let's zoom back out and uh, look at, just give a quick overview of some of the other branches and then we'll go into what, what you can actually do with this stuff kind of at a very high level. 
So multi-party computation, uh, we think about as kind of another orthogonal access to this verifiability property that ZK Snarks provide us with, right? So ZK Snarks allow us to make claims about single player private state um, by default. So, you know, I can prove that I know some satisfying private input W such that some arbitrary function or circuit F accepts on, you know, X comma W where X is some public public input. Um, translated into something like, you know, imagine playing some sort of decentralized game. Uh, this might allow you to prove things like, I have a sword with some secret stats and the power stat is at least 10. And I'm not gonna tell you any of the other stats and I'm not gonna tell you uh, what the power stat actually is, but I can prove to you that my sword has enough power to like take down this monster. Um, this is a common pattern in settings such as blockchain games, where you're going to need to prove to the contract or to the rest of the network that you can take some game action without revealing you know, the cards in your hand or the weapons in your inventory or something like this. Now, what we can't do with this <clears throat> is we can't make claims about multiplayer private state. So for example, if I have some interaction like I have some sword with some secret stats and you have a shield with some secret stats and I attack you, we can't purely with ZK figure out what the damage output is without you know, revealing something about our, our you know, mutual inputs. So this is something that needs something different, some orthogonal affordance. This needs multi-party uh, multi computation. Um, you can imagine extending sufficiently powerful general purpose multi-party computation to be able to do things like you know, recommendations. So I might possess some encrypted essay or article or movie that you don't know. You might have some particular you know, feature vector of your psychographic or demographic statistics that I don't know. And I might be able to recommend to you that like actually you would find this movie or this essay eight out of 10 enjoyable without us learning each other's information here. So again, not something you can do with ZK, um, requires multi-party computation. Uh, yes, you could use an enclave. I, I guess what I mean to say is this requires something beyond ZK snarks that is of the flavor of multi-party computation or homomorphic encryption or a trusted execution environment or is something different from ZK snarks, basically. Um, so, you know, multi-party computation in particular is also going through a similar uh, transition at the practical level from special purpose to general purpose. So, you know, many years ago, we had multi-party computation protocols for specific problems, such as the millionaire's problem, where you have two people, Alice and Bob, they have secret numbers. Um, you assume they follow the protocol honestly, but what they want to do is they want to figure out who has the bigger number without revealing anything else about their respective secret values. Um, <clears throat> and again, some very smart people figured out some very tricky ways in order to do this, uh, but, uh, the first kinds of protocols for these sorts of computations were built special purpose. Today, we're increasingly seeing the viability of systems that allow us to do this for arbitrary functions, arbitrary computations. Um, and as one example, even in just the last couple of years, uh, the TLS notary team at EF's privacy and scaling explorations has implemented a very efficient garbled circuits library that allows them to do things like AES and SHA uh, in multi-party computation over secret shared values. Um, so, you know, the maybe another kind of side note that I will point out here is that garbled circuits have existed for a while, uh, but what we're kind of seeing in the last couple of years, oh, and, you know, similarly, three coloring is NP complete. Um, so technically, if you have a ZKP for three coloring, you, you sort of have a ZKP for anything you want. Um, but what's happening in the last couple of years is that these things are becoming practically viable for things that people care about, such as standard first generation cryptographic primitives. Yeah, question. How does this actually, going back to Dan's question earlier, how does that actually compare to, for example, like Enclaves and other sorts of, you could argue that those are actually forms of programmable cryptography that have existed for 20 years. So um, how does this, these sorts of new things, how does it differ from that? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. Um, I think, so I have a set of slides that's not in this talk that that kind of discusses like how programmable is programmable cryptography. Uh, I kind of think of programmable cryptography not as necessarily like a binary 
transition, but rather a thing that happens in phases. And, you know, at the end of it, you, you ought to live in a world where someone ought to just be able to write some code. Someone who is not a cryptographer and has no knowledge of cryptography. They ought to be able to write some code and it should be able to pass through a number of different, you know, transpilers or whatever, end up executing with these cryptographic style guarantees. We've had a lot of these technologies for a while, whether it's enclaves or, you know, theoretical knowledge of garbled circuits. But the thing that's going on now, I think, is that these libraries or these technologies are reaching a level of maturity where someone who is not a cryptographer can practically start using Using them. Um, you know, in 2017, ZK Snarks existed, but if you wanted to use them, you had to implement the ZK Snark protocol. So you still had to be a, a pretty bleeding edge cryptographer there. Was it mostly still a UX problem then? Um, I think it's a combination. I think that there's a DevX problem. There's also sort of a performance problem, right? You need these things to be like one thing we can kind of track is the ratio of doing a computation like natively versus doing it inside of cryptography for various kinds of cryptography. For different branches, that ratio needs to hit different thresholds in order for you to suddenly like be able to do, you know, various things you care to do like on your own mobile device. So, but now seems to be kind of the phase transition point where we're moving from like liquid to solid with this stuff over these couple of years. Could you repeat the question? Oh yeah, I can repeat the questions. The, the previous question was, um, we've had trusted execution environments for years. Uh, what could could it be argued that those are a form of programmable cryptography as well? And um, how do we think about kind of the timing on these things? <clears throat> cool. Um, so folks here are probably also familiar with fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, encryption is a tool that allows you to obfuscate or, or kind of lock data. One of the issues, though, is that it is very structure destroying. Encrypted data is gibberish, so we can't do things like index on it, search on it, run machine learning models on it, etc. That's a thing that we often care to do. We would like to do these things while preserving privacy. So how do we do that? Um, and you know, the answer here is that there are forms of encryption that are just starting to reach feasibility today where you can perform computations on encrypted data and get the encrypted you know, proper result of the computation as if it was run on plain text data. And so another form of this programmability or, or general purpose computation. Um, Further out, we have more exotic primitives like witness encryption or functional encryption. So witness encryption says, well, you know, encryption is sort of static in the sense that you can only encrypt things to a key today, practically speaking. Um, imagine a world where you could encrypt something to a program or sort of an arbitrary condition with a bunch of, you know, binary predicates that, you know, express things that can change over time. Um, what that might look like is an encryption where the decryption key is a satisfying input to some program P. So let's say that um, you know I have some secret message, like the treasure is located at 103 comma 47. Um, I might be able to encrypt that with say a Sudoku puzzle, or I might be able to encrypt that to a like millennium problem solution verifier or something. You know, then I would get some ciphertext from that. And anyone who can provide a satisfying input to that like gatekeeper program whether that's the Sudoku solver or the Millennium problem, a uh, Millennium puzzle, you know, solution verifier would then be able to decrypt the uh, ciphertext. So once again, there's some sort of programmability element going on here. Cool. And then finally, at the very top of this particular tech tree or reductions tree is indistinguishability obfuscation, the closest thing we know of to black box obfuscation, where, you know, the, the rough model here is I can take a program and I can turn it into a black box where I can't understand anything about its internals, um, but I have input output access to it. Um, indistinguishability obfuscation in some ways kinds of looks like non-interactive FHE or MPC. Um, we're very far from this, but uh, you know, we were very far from ZK Snarks at some point. So who knows, something interesting could happen. Okay, um, honorable mention here, I'm going to mention smart contracts as well, because I think they also illustrate this idea and they're very complementary to a lot of the technologies we talk about with programmable cryptography. So, you know, under some very reductive view, Bitcoin says, well, here's a technology proof of work that allows us to achieve consensus over a table, a, a mapping table from identifiers to balances, <clears throat> as well as uh, an ordering of actions, each of which looks like decrement the balance of this identifier by N and increment the balance of this identifier by N. Of course, this is not actually how Bitcoin works, but we can sort of model it as, as working like this, right? So we can achieve consensus over a very special purpose um, kind of you know state transition function. 
And with smart contracts such as you know Ethereum and programmable blockchains, we can achieve consensus over the state of a Turing complete VM and over the ordering of arbitrary structured data that everybody can interpret as you know executing on some Turing complete machine. So again, this this pattern of programmability has obviously been very important in the blockchain world, allowing us to have things like DeFi and you know on chain games and ID and social things. Um, the question is, what might that do if we zoom out to cryptography as a whole? Cool. So that's kind of the crash course on, on programmable cryptography. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so hopefully this concept is pretty clear. Uh, what I wanna talk about now is what can we do with programmable cryptography? Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present three uh, directions of applications that are progressively more speculative or if you will, unhinged. Um, these are not meant to be either a complete or a correct set of speculations on what might happen with programmable cryptography. It's more to demonstrate like the sort of thinking that we might be able to do when we take these technologies as first class citizens rather than necessarily needing to, you know, either find a way to fit them into blockchains or considering them as like their own isolated you know, technologies. So let's dig in. Um, the first one is, I actually think, fairly uncontroversial. This is the idea of uh, what, what I call the universal protocol. So it's motivated by the following problem. You know, in general, consider the problem where someone on the internet wants to ask someone else on the internet for some data. Um, obviously, this is a very general problem. Arguably, this is why the internet exists. So if we can say something about this problem, that, that's very interesting. So roughly speaking, this is how that pattern plays out today. So we might have two parties, a requester and someone who's being queried for information. The person on the right might say, you know, to the person on the left, are you Gubsheep, right? Gubsheep is like an online identifier. And what happens today is the person on the left might go to some sort of identity provider, such as Mr. Zuckerberg over here. And he says, please respond for me. And Mr. Zuckerberg says, yep, he's Gubsheep. And so this is a very simplified diagram of what today we know of as the OAuth protocol. Um, in a similar vein, the person on the right might ask, what's your credit score? And the person on the left might say, you know, go to some provider like Equifax and say, please respond for me. And F Equifax will kind of go around and gather a bunch of my data. And then Equifax will say to the person on the right, his credit score is 740. Right. So the general pattern here is that the person on the right says, given some arbitrary function F, compute for me F of your personal data. And... <clears throat> When I'm posed with some sort of you know, question like this, there's kind of two things that might happen. Uh, you know, I'm gonna go to some set of data custodians or service providers on the internet, and I might say, please respond for me. And in the happy path, what's gonna happen is that these folks, they'll get together or they'll, they'll kind of look in their data stores and they'll say, here's what you need to know about Gupsheep. That's the happy path. Now in the sad path, uh, they might say something like, you know, that API does not exist, or that operation is not aligned with our business incentives, or that data is split amongst 10 providers who don't have a licensing agreement. Um, and I would wager that 90% of the useful queries that like human civilization could be making are probably locked up in the sad path and not the happy path. And even the happy path itself has a bunch of weird kind of negative externalities, right? Um, we, you know, we talk about privacy, we talk about, you know, data, um, so, so I sort of think about this as like, you know, today we have the myth of consensual digital communication, where if two parties want to exchange information, they can't just exchange information. You have to make sure that, you know, you're checking, isn't there somebody you forgot, you forgot to ask? Um, okay, so here's the world with programmable cryptography. In this world, and actually the, this first query, I'm going to give an example of, you don't even need programmable cryptography, you just need regular cryptography, but bear with me. Um, the person on the right asks the person on the left, are you Gubsheet? OK, person on the left says yes, and they provide some sort of cryptographic stamp that the person on the right can look at in order to understand how to interpret the query and uh, in order to understand that, that that response is actually a valid response. This is sort of what cryptography does. OK, and then we've got, you know, Zuck over here making sad Zuck noises. Um, so, uh, oh, this was from another workshop that I was doing with these slides called the cryptographic iceberg. But the person on the right might ask, are you a cryptographic iceberg attendee? And the person on the left might simply be able to say yes and provide some cryptographic proof. This could be a group signature. This could be a zero knowledge proof of Merkle inclusion. Um, but the point is it's self-contained. We don't need some sort of third person over here who's mediating this interaction. The person on the right can just look at that string and, and be satisfied with the response. 
So what's your credit score? The person on the left might gather their own data and they might perform some computation over it, verify some signatures, uh, parse a JSON or parse a PDF, uh, run some sort of financial model on some things and output 740. And again, they'll be able to include a cryptographic stamp with that, that the person on the right can look at to understand uh, A, that the person on the left is not lying, and B, that uh, you know this is a validly formed response. They understand how to, how to read and interpret and parse it. So again, programmable cryptography here is, is cutting out this sort of intermediate step and giving flexibility. So one way you can kind of think about this world is it's a world where the person on the left controls their own data and what they do with it, <clears throat> and where they're actually able to generate like personal APIs like on the fly. So the person on the right can insert you know, any arbitrary query here into this interaction, any arbitrary F where they're requesting the person on the left computes F of something. And the person on the left can gather their data from a bunch of different sources, execute F on all of this data that they've gathered, and then stamp it with some cryptographic stamp and give that back to the person on the right. So we've sort of got this like API defined at runtime thing. It's privacy preserving, uh, it's peer to peer. Um, in general, this is a very you know, powerful kind of primitive that you could imagine for communication. And this is, this is absolutely not how the world works today. It's something that is specifically unlocked by the ability to perform arbitrary computation inside cryptography. Um, and of course, this doesn't have to be people, this can be machines, services, businesses, governments, whatever you like. Um, so, you know, one way that I kind of think about what's going on here is that cryptography is going to unlock a universal protocol, a single protocol for all your social data, data, your digital identity, financial history, professional interactions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we'll live in a world where every website on the internet will be handling and outputting data in a way that is compatible with the universal protocol. And every website can ingest data that is you know, formatted in accordance with the universal protocol. Of course, this protocol's universality comes from the fact that it is made of cryptography. It's made of math. Anyone, anywhere can access the API of, of math. Plus, as long as we've got a couple of a couple of registries out there, you know, key registries, things like that. Yep. Yep. So, then it's not so clear how yeah so if f is private you could imagine doing a multi-party computation between these two sides so maybe this is a bank they have their own way of doing credit scoring and they perform an mpc with me i have my data from stripe and ethereum and the irs um, and we do a verifiable mpc um, or i guess if it's a two pc we don't even necessarily need to do that um does that sort of Answer oh, the setup. Hmm. I see. Try to get rid of the third party, but then it creeps back in because it's all money. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah. This is fair. I think that there's there's a couple of things going on here, which still at least give this world more flexibility. So one is that you can toggle the bit of whether the third party actually gets to see any of this data. So that's one thing that's very important. So that that third party changes from being like a data custodian to being more like a notary. Um, and I think that's already kind of a powerful shift. What's that? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so Dan's question was, uh, what happens if F is private? Oftentimes uh, these financial institutions want to know what your credit score is, but they don't want to tell you the formula because you would be able to, to game it. Is that a secure answer? Like that the data was gathered like properly and that after that was Yeah. So the, all of that is going to have to live at the level of abstraction where we're defining like the standards for what constitutes valid data. So here are the valid sources of data. You know, there's the Ethereum blockchain root, uh, root hash. There's like, you know, this was the key of the IRS at that time. It was timestamped, and we're going to prove that that timestamp was between A and B. Maybe there's some network of timestamp servers. Um, so there will need to be infrastructure to like give meaning to which hashes are allowed hashes to to you know take your trust root of. 
But yeah, this, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. Following up on that would be like, how do you actually create that form of like a cryptographic like standard, like kind of like a JSON style standard for all of this stuff in the first place? Yep. So the question is, how do you create, how do you imagine creating cryptographic standards for these kinds of, you know, registries or providers or, or you know, whatever else we need to agree on what is valid data? Um, that's an open question. Let me get back to that in, in a bit. Um, maybe the first thing that I'll say just to dig one level deeper into like some of the machinery that's going on here is that, uh, you know, the thing that's kind of enabling this world where we have the universal protocol is this idea of like the universal cryptographic adapter, which can take any cryptographic data that originates in whatever source and is, you know, signed or encrypted or mapped or whatever, um, and sort of perform whatever computation or trans transmutation on this data, aggregation, composition, whatever, uh, to output something that is understandable by a third party who is not directly talking to any of these data sources. So this oftentimes can take the form of something like a ZK snark. A ZK snark is you know, a, a piece of verifiable computation on something that originated um, from, from one of these sources. Um, there's a couple of examples of projects that are uh, doing things of this flavor today. For example, ZK email, TLS notary, or ZooPass and the proof carrying data framework um, are all starting to actually approach production. And they all kind of implement something that looks like this. So this is actually not that speculative of a programmable cryptography uh, <clears throat> application, but you know it just goes to show how, how close this stuff actually is to the horizon. Um, you know. Maybe one thing I'll say also on, on that question is that uh, each of these projects has various kinds of solutions for this. So for example, um, you know, TLS Notary takes the position that like actually HTTPS traffic is going to be really important, but we're going to be very unopinionated about what we expect to be going through HTTPS traffic. Uh, ZooPass and the Proof Carrying Data Framework implicitly have a more ZK friendly standard for data to get like picked up and shipped and like made proofs about. And of course, ZK email is more opinionated towards, you know, DKIM and and the whatever format emails take. Ah, yes. So ZK email is a very clever uh, tool. So um, basically, almost all emails today are signed with a protocol called DKIM. In other words, whenever you receive an email from an at stanford.edu email address, that email is signed by the stanford.edu mail server. This allows you to make proofs about emails that you have received from you know whatever senders. So I could make a proof if I received an email from you know at twitter.com or at x.com that I possess some string that was signed by such and such public key. And that public key can be looked up via DNS. So you can correspond it to twitter.com's public key. I possess some string signed by this key such that with when some publicly known regex R is run on the string, it parses out, it, it matches out a, a specific substring. And with this, you can prove like I control a given Twitter account or um, whatever else you care about here. So you can sort of export your data out of Twitter. Um, cool. So yeah, the universal protocol is a really important potential primitive. Uh, you could replace all sorts of third party middlemen or at least turn them from data custodians into notaries. Uh, you would have this world where the internet might feel more like a single fluid backend that uh, things like you know the different social media platforms are simply views or front ends into rather than their own siloed platforms. Um, you could have universal and interoperable digital identity standards that work across all websites, businesses, governments, et cetera, because you have an adapter that can translate. It's like a little babble fish in your ear that can translate between any different, the language of any different silos. Cool. Okay, so that is the least speculative of our three applications. Let's talk about the next one, nanobots in cyberspace. Um, so this phrase is courtesy of Barry Whitehat and Yan Zhang. I just lifted it and made some slides here. Um, okay, so how many folks here have played uh, something in like the, the Legend of Zelda franchise? People know like Zelda, Link, it's like a cultural thing. Okay, no problem. So, so um, you know, this is a uh, Nintendo game. The protagonist who you play as is Link. And one interesting, you know, mechanic <clears throat> in this set of games is that sometimes there is a thing called a Navi, which is like a fairy navigator or guide or companion to your character in this game. And what it does is it like interacts with the world on your behalf. 
So sort of flying around, it like flies over an object and then you can press A and that causes you to like pick up the object. It like mediates interaction between you and the world. And so uh, we wanna take this kind of analogy and apply it to the cryptographic world of the future where we have all these powerful programmable cryptography tools. So you could kind of imagine in the future that we might have like crypto novies. You know, you could think of this as a cryptographic user agent that's running locally on your consumer device. Um, because it's running locally, it can be trusted to have full visibility into your personal data and all of your digital footprint and all of your traffic. And what it can do is it can kind of fly around cyberspace and it can automatically generate ZKPs and participate in various different multi-party computations or FHE interactions over the network on your behalf. So as, as a user agent, sort of how as how the browser was conceived of in like the mid nineties. So, you know, today, let's say that link wants to talk to Facebook, you know, make some posts, send some likes, retrieve their newsfeed, whatever, you know, right now they're talking directly with Facebook, which is custodying their data. <clears throat> in the future, you can imagine this interaction, interaction being mediated by a Navi, where basically the Navi is interacting with this kind of blinded Facebook on behalf of the user, right? So. Uh, the user is going to be sending all these interactions and retrieving all of this data. And what the Navi is going to do <clears throat> is uh, it's sort of, you know, scrambling all of these things such as like you can imagine this interaction happening where Facebook has some sort of, you know, it's, it's holding everything in fully homomorphic encryption. Um, and what that means is that these particular Facebook servers could get swapped out for some other social, uh, basically, you know, platform backend that conforms to the same protocol. It's almost just kind of providing like a, a you know data availability-esque kind of service. The Facebook protocol exists as the set of computations that everybody's Navi's performs with this you know central data store and with each other. Um, but the data store itself does not actually know anything about about what's going on. It's just sort of carrying out these computations and it doesn't know what they are. Um, you know, another thing you can imagine is like uh, you could have this world where these Navis are talking to each other. They're mediating peer-to-peer -peer interactions as well. So, you know, let's say that you have some peer-to-peer -peer interaction. You've got, you know, Link over here and you've got Zelda over here. They've got their respective Navis. They've got their respective personal data. Um, and what they might be able to do is they might be able to perform these various like multi-party computations with each other. So you can imagine these Navis like flying around cyberspace and all the time kind of performing these multi-party computations as their users are requesting or as they find might be useful. So here, <clears throat> these Navis might perform an MPC to determine, like, are we compatible? You could imagine, like, an MPC dating app or something. Um, you could also imagine things like, you know, matching employment, matching various kinds of, like, financial interactions, order matching, et cetera. Um, and all of this is just sort of happening in Navi space, which is this, like, virtual world where this data is not actually getting exchanged over the wire. Um, and so, you know, you might imagine you have this world of a bunch of people with their Navis flying around. They're interacting with these centralized services, which are now blinded. They're interacting with each other. Um, all sorts of like useful and interesting kind of multiplayer data computations are emerging out of this like fabric of these nanobots in cyberspace. Yep, question. So, in this world, I guess, you know, currently, you know, users quantify the information they give despite everyone being able to see the ability to safely for for every outcome, like say you're gonna do that. How should users locally, when they're interacting with encrypted like users, like I don't know, like at some point, of course, all their information is gonna be leaked. And so how like uh, what is a meaningful way of presenting like a pretty present or at least analyzing it? Yeah. So the question is, data is leaked uh, whenever I'm performing an MPC with someone, or data might be leaked whenever I perform an MPC with someone else. If I'm performing MPCs with other people all the time, with a bunch of my personal data, at some point, I kind of expect that a big chunk of it just like lives out in the world, more or less in plain text. And how can I quantify that? Um, yeah, this is a great question. We don't know. I think this is a similar, like there's a parallel thing going on with, for example, ZKML, right? Where we ask about like, how much can I actually learn about a private model if I have input, output access. Um, I think that ultimately we can't assume that you know, we have these airtight cryptographic guarantees on our data. Um, the, the main things that I think about here though that are interesting is that like nonetheless, this is still very interesting for the following reason. It shifts the defaults in some sense, right? Like imagine that cryptography or programmable cryptography just gets so cheap that you know, even though, yeah, you're leaking a bit of information here, 
it doesn't really matter because it's strictly better than the previous world. And because this interaction is incredibly cheap just to be like running on your own consumer device. So now you're in a world where you just, you, you have like sort of the best that you can get by default. Um, at some point, if you if you match, you can't avoid giving out some data, but you can you can minimize uh, the like amount that you're giving out. There's sort of a principle of least permissions sort of thing, or what is it? Principle of least privilege thing that's that's going on here. Um, I think we'll probably need to figure out like some some metric to quantify things. But even if we don't have these airtight guarantees, this world is still interesting because it's a meaningfully different equilibria in the space of possible webs. Like for one thing, you would have to go across, you know, a hundred different actors to collect all of the data for a specific person. And already that coordination problem like makes it at least much harder to to you know figure out the back end data of someone. Yeah, yeah. You could also have every interaction is with like, you know, you identify yourself with a nullifier or something. Yeah. I mean, just like a comment here. Um like broadly like differential privacy and hack privacy are frameworks that are set up to allow you to reason about what you are leaking. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that would be an interesting so to... Kind of dense, so. Yeah, that'd be a great thing to start pulling into this conversation for sure. Do you have any plan for all uh, of these uh, um, interactions with uh, Facebook? Um, and in that in that scenario, you might, Facebook might need to change their uh, APIs to like, support these kind of uh, operations. Um, can you say something about how much can be achieved without having Facebook change their APIs? Like yeah. What incentives Facebook has for this? Yeah, so, so one question is like, why would Facebook bother uh, changing their API to support this kind of thing that like strictly gives away power? Um, or how far can we get without needing them to do anything here? Um, let me actually go to the next section because that provides some kind of partial answer here. Um, so one other way you can think about like the set of things that you can do with Navi's is um, there's this idea that you can hallucinate backends. And this is actually an idea that dates back something like 25 years to some essay from Nick Szabo in like 1997. So if you look up the God protocols, a lot of the ideas of like programmable cryptography are actually, you know, written down there when he sort of realized that garbled circuits were a thing. Um, so, you know, today applications sort of look like this, where you've got Facebook, uh, and you've got a bunch of people interacting directly with Facebook and Facebook's got, you know, some database where they're storing a bunch of stuff. Um, you could imagine a future actually where the Navis, they get together and they hallucinate something that looks like Facebook. Like imagine if Facebook was actually just a huge multi-party computation between, you know, the billion plus users on it, or like a given forum service, like a discourse or a discord server was actually just a big multi-party computation between everybody like on that server. Um, so in this case, you could imagine that like, uh, you know, you can basically cut out Facebook and you can spin up this sort of social platform or social network on the fly somehow. And in combination with the universe.
conceptualization is that like, let's take the universal protocol stuff. A lot of this data has to originate somewhere. Now, ideally, we'd hope that it, it originates in these kind of like, you know, permissionless, like Merkle rooted, you know, blockchain kinds of systems like Ethereum or whatever else. But the reality is a lot of it's going to originate from trusted testers. Now, if some government can figure out like, wait a second, if I can just be like the trusted tester and get to a point where like sort of the norm of this world is that if you see an attestation or like a, a piece of data originating from a public key that's not a government you know, agency, then that's like, oh, that's bad data. That's bootleg data. You know, then you're in sort of a dangerous place. Um, on the other hand, governments and businesses can also try to be like adversarial to this in certain ways. They can choose to use, you know, they can choose to like not sign their APIs or to the extent that they're signing them today, use like very programmable cryptography, unfriendly functions, uh, signature functions in order to do this kind of signing. Um, I imagine that it will probably vary from government to government, but this is where I think there's like this interesting idea we can lift from like, you know, Vitalik has this essay on like uh, engineering security through coordination problems, where basically what you would need is you would need like all the governments and major businesses of the world to come together and collude in order to stop data from being exportable, attributable, uh, these like parallel worlds being able to be instanced. Um, so I think that like, somehow somewhere pockets of this will start to come up and grow and then it will kind of be like a you know do you want to get swept up in the wave 20 years from now or do you want to try to like tune your business models and your regulatory regimes um you know towards this stuff cool all right um so yeah many applications of nanobots in cyberspace what's up oh share the screen yes um would you mind giving me screen share access Cool, thank you. Um, yeah, many applications to kind of summarize some of them you can get. Your Navi might find for you like recommendations for products, content, a job, or even like a date um, without your data ever leaving your computer. So the Navi is like flying around in cyberspace and it never you know leaks your data except for what is necessary to actually perform that match. Um, you could spin up these new virtual backends. Um, you could, for example, get notified if you're at risk of some disease or medical outcome based off of the latest research that just has entered the public domain uh, without ever needing to actually move your data off your local device. So, okay. So the final one that I have here. Yes. Why, why is it we don't, we don't already have this? Um, so, okay. The question is, why don't we already have this? Um, well, I think that there's a couple of things going on here that haven't really like matured. I'm not super familiar with the latest state of like garbled circuits and MPC uh, and FHE. My like background is more in ZK stuff, but my general sense is that like the level of difficulty in working with a lot of the technologies that would underpin this sort of stuff is maybe where snarks were in like 2017 or 18, I want to say, um, where, you know, the like both in terms of performance and developer experience, you can't actually have someone who's at the level of like, oh, you know, they're a developer who like writes some Python code and has enough of a mental model to like compile this down to application logic that uses cryptography. Um, another thing is like that kind of, you know, ratio between how much uh, like computational resource you need to do the thing in cryptography versus to do it natively. I think that the like overhead on bandwidth for a lot of the MPC stuff that the PSC library uses is probably like, um, I want to say it's like on the order of like hundreds. So if you want to do a computation over like a kilobyte of data, it requires like a megabyte of bandwidth or, or something like this. I'm probably getting like the exact order of magnitude wrong. Um, but like similarly with how like snark performance has been like inching, you know, further and further close to like native computation over time, probably the same thing needs to happen with MPC and FHE. Yeah. On, on the meta level, I also suspect that like Blockchains have provided a really like powerful incentive for ZK to get better. Um, so ZK has gotten just like better, like really fast over the last six years. This is like a, a Dan take that I really like, which is that like blockchains and ZK are a very natural fit because ZK gives you verifiable computation, which is the thing that you care about in blockchains. Um, blockchains have like a lot of money in them, just like very, very directly and legibly. So like we can kind of optimize like, you know, the hell out of that stuff. Um, and that's part of what this kind of, you know, talk or line of thinking is meant to do is like, well, let's also start looking at a bunch of this other stuff too. 
Okay, so uh, my final example here is cryptometer, which is a word um, that you sort of just made up. Uh, it's short for cryptographic automata. Um, and it, this idea comes from the following thought experiment. So today we can put ZK verifiers on the blockchain. Um, what will happen when we can put, for example, like collaborative snark systems with verifiers on blockchains, or once we can do fully homomorphic encryption in a smart contract, or run an obfuscated program on a blockchain? Well, then things get like really, really interesting. So the, the thing that I think about here is like, if you could run an obfuscated program on a blockchain, you would get a cryptometer, which I think of as like a glowing blue orb that's sort of like floating in cyberspace. It's this like autonomous, like basically shell where, you know, inside of it, let me, let me use this diagram. Inside of it, it's got its own like self-sovereign application state. Maybe it's got user records or some permissions or source code or whatever else. Um, no one can like pry open the cryptometer and look at its internal state. And then furthermore, like a smart contract, it's got source code such that it, you know, responds to requests or updates or transition functions or whatever exactly as it's programmed to do. So you've got this unstoppable application that like holds its own private state and runs and self modifies exactly as, you know, it's been set out originally. And it exposes like a permissionless interface, which, you know, can kind of respond to the outside world in predictable ways. So in some sense, this is like if God ran an Express JS server or like God's AWS is sort of where all of these like floating blue orbs are running, right? So um, yeah, you know, you'd be able to use the universal protocol to talk to these things. Um, you'd be able to like update data. And again, just stamping this stuff cryptographically would allow you to do the operation exactly as intended. Um, cryptometer could talk to each other. And you can imagine like running like joins or like deep call stacks across like networks of cryptometer because they're just so dang reliable, right? They always execute, you know, exactly as planned. They're executing on a blockchain, so they're like executing synchronously. This would be like a crazy interoperable world. Um, so my prediction is that in the far future, humanity's like core civilizational infrastructure is going to be running inside of these floating blue orbs in cyberspace. So we'll have like, you know, global ID registries that like live in cryptomata. And you can imagine like running a physics simulation and getting this like autonomous digital universe that's just like running inside a cryptomata. Um, you know, financial markets, of course. Um, you can imagine like all of humanity's like medical records and genetic data living in some set of cryptomata. And then researchers can run these various like aggregate queries over them. Um, you can imagine like running an AGI inside of a cryptomata, and that would be like a truly like self-sovereign brain that like has, you know, it just, it just keeps kind of executing itself. You can't look at the secrets inside of its head. I mean, this is just like, we don't really understand the implications of this, but these are very interesting things to consider. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, just a brain question. So like, you know, you can think of smart contracts as like providing aliveness, yep. like integrity, mm -hmm. right? Is this sort of like private state smart contracts or is it even more than that? Yeah, so one question, uh, the question here is, you can kind of think about smart contracts as providing liveness and integrity guarantees. Is this pr providing like privacy guarantees? Yeah. Um, I think that this is approximately correct, but one, one issue I have generally with the word privacy is it carries this kind of like ideological connotation to some extent, like, oh. you know, um, which is which is not a bad thing. Like I'm I'm very much aligned with that. But like there's an information asymmetry thing that's really key to a lot of systems, even just like functioning mechanically. Like for example, the game of poker simply does not work if all of our cards are just like face up. And there's like many such systems. Um, and you know smart contracts are limited in that it can you can only have your cards face up. Uh, it turns out that when you have your, your cards face down in global state, then um, yeah, I think that this is basically like kind of the the logical end game of a lot of the privacy blockchain stuff. It's sort of the best you can hope to get. Now, there is one more axis, which I kind of didn't put on here because I think it's a little bit too speculative or crazy. Um, but one issue still with cryptometer, as stated in this way, is that you can kind of like, um, <clears throat> you know, you can copy a cryptometer locally and sort of feed it whatever inputs you want and get like whatever output from that. Um, what we'd really like to have is cryptometer where like, you know, if someone queries it like once, then that just changes the state of it. And for that, you might need like quantum stuff, like one shot signatures, or maybe if we figure out some way to do like one time memories or something like that, then you'd have these cryptometer that are basically like physical, almost like physical informational objects that are just sort of like floating there. Um, but mainly the reason I bring that up is because there's like multiple different like orthogonal like capability vectors here. Smart contracts and blockchains give one of them. 
uh, like obfuscation and cryptography gives another one. And then this like, you know, weird quantum stuff might like give even another one. Or using, oh, using enclaves. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so enclaves are also very powerful here. Um, cool. So yeah, just like to bring it down to earth a little bit, uh, in cryptometer world, uh, you'd have this world where all web services always know what to expect from each other at the deepest levels. They're highly composable. Um, Cross-program calls are ordered and instantaneous, and this comes from consensus technology. Um, data and program execution is guaranteed to, to be correct. That comes from things like SNARKs, ZKVMs, and you know the blockchain execution guarantees. Um, you could imagine like cross-cryptomata or cross-service interactions uh, via things like recursive ZK, FHE, MPC. Um, and, you know, programs in general, they can autonomously maintain like global private state thanks to things like, uh, you know, obfuscation. So this would be a very powerful future of the of digital communications indeed. So, yeah, we talked about some of the like, you know, crazy implications here. Running an AGI inside of a cryptometer gives you almost like a real physical being. Uh, running a physics simulation inside of a of a cryptometer gives you almost like a real like physical reality with like the hardness of our reality, um, despite the fact that it's like purely made of information. Um, but a little bit more grounded, we can kind of expect that as cryptography gets better, um, hopefully more and more of our like civilization scale infrastructure migrates to be you know built on these highly interoperable and resilient systems. These two are kind of just fun speculation to, you know, provoke thinking. Okay, cool. So to recap, I, I have one more mini section after that, but just to recap where we are right now, um, we claimed at the very beginning that there's some sort of dark matter thing going on with the future of computation. That's neither, you know, like AI or the chips thing, or, you know, what we currently think of as Web3 uh, or, you know, like VR. Um, <clears throat> and you know, the, the point here of the, of the last like three examples is that there's just a very new and underexplored design space of digital applications that's coming and that's going to be coming fast. And the specific ideas we've just given um, in the last three sections might not be the exactly correct ones. They might not be exactly accurate, but they should, you know, give you some sense of the direction and provoke some thinking about what we might be dealing with here. Um, I actually think the first of these three is basically like uncontroversially going to happen. The next two are a little bit more speculative. Um, and the final thing that I want to say here is, is kind of an argument for why to think about programmable cryptography as a whole, as a holistic discipline, why these things aren't just applications of SNARKs or like they aren't just applications of FHE. Well, you know, historically, when we've looked at the technologies on this tech tree, oftentimes as practitioners at the, at the application level, we think about applications as like, well, we've got multi-party computation. What like useful business function can we serve with that? And with SNARKs, we've got stuff like rollups and privacy coins. And with FHE, we've got stuff like AI inference on private data. With MPC, we've got like, you know, beat auctions where the farmers can make private bids. And with ORAM, we can do things like private contact discovery on a, on a messaging app. Um, <clears throat> and I kind of think that the way that we're thinking about a lot of these technologies today is uh, sort of like how we were thinking about a lot of things that became part of computing um, back in, you know, maybe like 30 to 50 years ago. Uh, in contrast, though, these applications that we've talked about that are, you know, crazy pie in the sky things, they require multiple branches. In fact, some of them require every single branch. So the universal cryptographic adapter requires, you know, ZK SNARKs, PAR, in some cases, MPC. Um, MPC itself kind of refers not to MPC specifically, but also including FHE and trusted execution environments. Um, this thing over here with like the, the Navis and the nanorobots in cyberspace, that's like an MPC FHE thing, but you might also want to layer verifiability on top. So maybe you want collaborative snarks there. And then this thing sort of just needed like everything. This was like very speculative. Um, now, you know, back 50 years ago, we had these technologies starting to come to maturity like fiber optic cable and non-volatile memory and liquid crystal displays. Um, and if you sort of thought about these technologies in isolation, kind of like today we've got like the ZK community or like, you know, the FHE ecosystem, you might think of things like, well, as non-volatile memory gets better, we're going to be able to make smaller and smaller floppy disks. And eventually we're going to be able to put an entire library on a floppy disk. Or with fiber optic cables, like initially these things were used to get higher bandwidth phone lines or televisions. And with liquid crystal displays, um, 
you know, you were able to make thinner displays. So you could go from like CRTs to like a plasma TV or something like this. But obviously none of those applications, which are like individual applications of these things, were like the actual thing, the actual story going on with this stuff. You know, with all of these things, what they were actually moving towards was this idea of, you know, personal computing. So for example, non-volatile memory allows you to have storage that persists when you turn your computer off, which is a really important and fundamental, you know, sort of assumption that we make about computing. Um, LCDs allow you to have programmable displays in a way that is, you know, a lot cheaper and easier. Um, and that gives rise to like basically all of modern interface technology. Uh, and something like fiber optic cables, well, you know, 90% plus of the world's internet traffic now goes through fiber optic cables. So the story here was not about making, you know, higher quality phone lines. It was about enabling, you know, the world to become actually interconnected. And, you know, similarly, we have this really low resolution diagram here um, from my, from my co-founder, Justin, uh, this idea of maybe what we're building here is a mathematical computer. And the way to think about, you know, ZK is ZK is kind of like the wires that allow the mathematical computer to like interact with the rest of the world. And like, you know, FHE and MPC is kind of the cryptographic CPU and it needs access to ORAM in order to be able to, you know, perform computations on data stores efficiently. Ethereum and the blockchain in this world is really, it's not necessarily, you know, the world computer, it's the world hard drive. It's the civilizational scale hard disk that everything sort of like grounds out in. Um, and, you know, we don't know exactly, like obviously this is, this is a skeuomorphic, this is like an overly reductive pattern matching. But the point here is that these are not technologies that are just, you know, considered in isolation. We, we should look at the whole picture here. And that gives rise to asking questions like what are, you know, verifiability friendly FHE schemes or like, you know, collaborative snarks. How do we make these things that like explore the, the, you know, the interconnects? What are the actual performance thresholds that need to be hit across multiple disciplines at the same time in order to unlock some new category? Um, and so, you know, from the, the, you know, practitioner to research feedback loop, I think that things can get a lot more multidimensional and interesting if we really understand this picture. Um, cool. Okay, so kind of a final word about Xerox Park. Um, this kind of stuff is what Zero X Park is thinking about. Uh, you know, roughly speaking, we've got this dark matter thing. We sort of recognize that it exists. We don't really understand it. We want to send out a bunch of probes into it. Uh, we have probes at like many different levels of the stack. Uh, some teams focus on the further out research necessary to understand the higher levels of this tech tree, um, such as Brian Lawrence here, who is my colleague at Zero X Park. Uh, some teams are in-house and building production facing things such as the ZooPass team that's building one of these universal cryptographic adapters. Uh, some teams are external and semi-independent in building things like infrastructure for computational composability. We give large grants to various companies like Lattice uh, or nonprofits like IDEN3, which build you know, infrastructure for a bunch of different parts of this world. Um, and if you're interested in getting involved, uh, here's my email address. You can feel free to reach out to me. But thanks everyone for coming and this was a lot of fun.